Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. And uh, got through the winter weather and come to church. Amen. All right, take your Bibles. Let's go to Jonah chapter 2, please. Jonah chapter 2. We ended last week with uh, them throwing Jonah overboard and uh, God preparing a great fish in verse number 17 of chapter 1. And it says Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now let's look at chapter 2. And we'll read this chapter. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth clothed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord... We pray that you'll open our understanding tonight. Holy Spirit of God, illumine us this evening as you had these words penned in the Scripture. Lord, we're asking you to help us to glean some truths from them tonight that will help us and will enable us to be better servants of yours. We love you. We ask you to help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the sailors, as we mentioned, have thrown them overboard and God has a whale there to swallow Jonah up. And, uh, and I, I don't know that what the Bible doesn't say is we don't know. We know that he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. We don't know how long it was before he was swallowed by the whale. 
I don't know if it was immediately. I, I kind of think that God was letting Jonah believe he was going to die. Uh, I think he went down for more than the third time. And he was going down under and he thought this was it. Uh, he talks about the waters compassing him about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds are wrapped around my head. Uh, I think he uh, thought he was going to die. And by the way, at that stage, Jonah would rather have died than gone to Nineveh. That's why I think he wasn't afraid about them throwing me overboard. Uh, he said, I'd rather die than go, do, go preach to those people. And, uh, but God isn't going to let him off that easy. Okay? And uh, he's going to teach him something here. Uh, as he gets into the, the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, as we said last week, the first three words of chapter 2 are very important. Then Jonah prayed. Remember, the other guys on the ship, they were all crying out to their God, but what was Jonah doing? Sleeping on the boat. He wasn't praying. In fact, the captain had to wake him up and say, pray, man. You got a God you call on? Pray to Him. It's a sad thing when unsaved people have to remind saved people to pray. And so uh, that's, uh, Jonah now decides he's going to pray. Several lessons we want to glean from this chapter here this evening, all right? And uh, number one is this, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. You say, what's that mean, preacher? It means God is in control. God is in control. You are not in control of your life. God is in control of your life. You think you're in control of your life. But it is God that is in control of your life. Let me, let me, let me note, notice something with me. Look at verse 15. So they took up Jonah. Who's they? Yeah, the crew on the boat, right? The sailors, right? They took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So, who threw Jonah overboard? The sailors did, right? The, the men on the, the mariners, right? But now look at chapter 2 and verse number 3. As Jonah prays, Jonah says, For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about, and all the billows and thy waves passed over me. Jonah didn't say, they threw me in the sea. Who did Jonah say threw me in the sea? God did. Who really threw Jonah in the sea? God did. God did. God was, God was behind that. Let me, another example of that. Um, go back to the book of Genesis. Put your mark in Jonah there so you can easily get back to it if you would piece of paper, a bookmark, or whatever. And look at Genesis chapter 45. Now when you th know Genesis 45 right away, you know we're going to talk about Joseph. That's right. Genesis 37 through 50 is the life of Joseph. All right. So when you go to Genesis 45, we're talking about Joseph. Most of you know Joseph was hated by his brothers. That's right. In fact, they hated him so much when he went out to see how they were doing, they... Uh, they, they took him and they uh, took off the coat that his father had made him and they threw him into a pit. And they were, uh, there would be pits out in the open area there, usually with some sharp rocks that they had made for the occasion down at the bottom, hoping animals would fall into the pit and be impaled on those sharp objects and be killed and then they'd have meat to eat. And so they put Joseph down in there, not to kill him, but so some animal dropping in there could kill him. All right? And, uh, but they, that's what they wanted to do. And then they, one of the brothers got convicted about that and said, well, maybe we shouldn't leave Mary. He went back and got him out of the pit. And uh, there comes some slave traders uh, heading down to Egypt. And they sold, David, or sold Joseph as a slave. All right? So wh who put him in the pit? His brothers. Who sold him as a slave? His brothers. He gets down into Egypt and he begins to work for a man named Potiphar. All right? And, and he works there for a little bit. Uh, but Potiphar's wife begins to look at him. And she begins to plot to get him to be hers and to be, uh, un, to, to be unfaithful to her husband. And he waits till everybody's out of the house. And, of course, she tries to move and Joseph runs away. She grabs his coat and then she accuses him. Oh, he forced himself on me and I caught his coat. Well, who ends up going to jail? Yeah, Joseph goes to prison. All right. Who put Joseph in prison? Potiphar's wife? 
You're going to find something out. Look at Genesis chapter 45. His brothers have come down and now He's revealing Himself to them. Verse 4, chapter 45, verse 4. Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in, in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. So when, when he was thrown into the pit and sold as a slave and put down to Egypt and even serving a prison sentence, who did all that? God. Because who's in control? Now none of those things would Joseph have chosen. He had the dream. Everybody bowing down to me. You all going to worship me. But that wasn't the path he was thinking he'd have to go to get there. Guarantee it. God is showing that it was God who's in control. And so why is it when things happen in our lives, we want to blame others? We want to hold on, well, my brothers treated me this way when I was growing up. My family, they were this way to me. And we play the victim. And we blame others. When we say we're just a victim or we're, we've had such trauma in our life and that's why we have to do this or that's why we're this way or that's why we act this way, you know what we're doing? We're writing God right out of the picture. And we conform to the world in this area as much as any other area. We adopt their terminology. Hey, they, I understand they'll come up with all the terms of what you are because you had this as a child or your dad took you to Indians games when you were a boy, you know, and, uh, you know, they were always in last place when we were growing up, you know, and uh, that's why you are the way you are. You know, they, people come up with all, oh, your mother was this way or your dad was this way or this is why you are this way. And so you have this and they'll give you some letters or initials and you think, oh, okay, so here I've got to be on this medication or this pill. That's what the world does. I want to ask you a question. Where's God? Do you think, do you think if, if Joseph would have been alive today, they'd have diagnosed him with some things? Oh, you were rejected by your brother, so you were sold as a slave, as a teenager? You poor thing. You need to be medicated. No, you know what Joseph said? God did that. God was preparing me. God was working in my life to make me what I am now. God's in control. God is sovereign. Doesn't mean all things are good, but all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them are the called according to His purpose. Well, I can tell this is real popular. I can tell. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See? Is God in control or not? Can God take the evil things that have happened in your life and turn them out for good? Yes, He can. Unless you want to be the victim and you want to keep blaming others and you want to have an excuse for why you want to behave the way you behave. Well, we're enjoying this point, aren't we? Pull over and park a while maybe, huh? Jonah's thrown overboard and God had prepared the, the great fish, a whale, ready to swallow him up. I, I don't know about you, I can imagine the Lord having a conversation with the whale. I can imagine God saying, uh, Shamu, probably wasn't his name, but <laughs> got a job for you. And of course the whale says, yes sir. Well, I need you to swallow a fellow for me. And I'm sure the whale said, come again. 
So I want you to swallow a guy for me, but, I, but you gotta, I, I'm going to give you exactly where to find him. But listen, before I do that, listen, no chewing, no biting, okay? You just need to swallow him whole, okay? Just put him down inside. Yes, sir. God gives him the exact GPS coordinates, where to go. Says, you know exactly where to be and what time to be there. And the whale says, I got it. I'll be there. Yes, sir. And of course, he was there. at The right spot, the right day, the right location, the right time. He's where he's supposed to be. Because the, the, his creation obeys him oftentimes much better than man creates him, obeys God. And the Lord prepared the fish to swallow Jonah. You know why? God is sovereign. God's in control. God, God uh, allows those things to come in and out of our life. He allows people to come in and out of our life. Okay? God is in control. When, in fact, are you still in Genesis 45? Look over to Genesis 50. Would you turn there, please? Genesis 50. Most of you are familiar with Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, verse 20 is kind of the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament. Romans 8.28 is we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. All right? All things work together for good. Now, Joseph's put it this way, As for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, how can he say that? He could only say verse 20 because he said verse 19. Verse 19 says, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. Joseph said, I'm not deciding that you guys were evil and that yeah, I'm going to resent you the rest of my life because of the way you treated me. Then I'm in the place of God. But I've come to realize God's in control of my life. And God had these things happen in my life that I were not in my control at all. But they weren't His. And so I will trust that He knows what's best for me. And that He'll use even things that people meant for evil to me, it can turn out for good. And that's to the glory of God. And that'll be to the glory of God and it'll be to the amazement of a lost world. God is sovereign. Let me give you lesson number two. Affliction... Affliction causes us to pray. Affliction causes us to pray. Affliction is a state of pain, distress, or grief. A state of pain, distress, or grief. Go back to Jonah chapter 2. Notice verse number 2. Then, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. That's why, that's why Jonah prayed. Now listen carefully. When Jonah was in the boat, was he praying? He was sleeping. He was pretty comfortable. He wasn't about to pray. Even when they told him to pray, he wouldn't pray. As long as the sailors were keeping Jonah in the boat, he wasn't going to pray. He wasn't going to talk to God. Now, they didn't want to throw him overboard. They worked hard not to. And once they did, they feared and they asked God to, to not put His innocent blood upon them. They, they were asking God to be merciful to them. They, they really feared for Jonah's life. I mean, I'm sure they're thinking like we would think, man, we throw him overboard, the storm's going to kill him. Sharks are going to get him. Uh, he's going to drown. You can't, you were in the middle of nowhere. You can't swim that far. I mean, we're, we're certainly throwing him to his death. In other words, if I throw him overboard, he'll never get the help he needs, poor guy. But the truth is, are you listening? By throwing him overboard, he got exactly the help he needed even though that was a difficult thing to do. Throwing them overboard is what God wanted them to do. Because He had prepared the great fish to take care of Him. 
Now, God could deal with Jonah. He, was, he, was, he sent the storm. But he didn't send the storm. And by the way, and the sailors struggled with that storm. Because Jonah was in their boat. Some of the people that paid to put cargo on the ship, they suffered because Jonah was on that ship. Because what did they do with some of the cargo? Threw it out. So they, now more people are suffering because of Jonah. And, and they, nobody got calm, nobody got peace until they threw Jonah overboard. And they put him out of their ship. Sometimes, sometimes the best way to get God to deal with somebody is to throw them out of your boat. as hard as that can be. Because you can be protecting them from what God wants to do in their life. If you get out of the way, God can deal directly with them without you buffering the process. God, God dealt with the prodigal son but when he told dad, let me out of here, I want to go, what did dad say? Gave him the money and said, go. Did dad follow him? Dad go out looking for him? Dad go out keep an eye on him? <laughs> no. He's gone. Oh, he stayed home and looked for him. He watched for him. But he let him go. And guess who dealt with him? God did. God dealt with him. When he was afflicted, when that prodigal was in pain and distress and grief, he prayed. He turned to God. Then, notice, then Jonah prayed. What will your then be? What will it be that you'll have to look back and say, then? I decided I better pray. Then I decided I better get serious about God. What will your then be? What pain, distress, or grief will be the moment when you cry out to God and say, okay God, I'll do it your way. I'll do it your way. That's what Joan has to come to. What a prayer room. The belly of a whale. Think of the smell. Now I know some of you eat fish. God bless you. But those things stink, man. And, and if you, you know, I don't know, some of you go fishing and you, why do you think you put them in a container and shut the lid? Because you don't want to smell the things probably. I can't imagine what it smelled like in the belly of that whale. The stench that must have been there. The other things that must have been in there. And Jonah spent three days and three nights there. In the school of prayer. Notice in verse number 7, he makes a statement, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. When my soul fainted within me. Faint means to grow weak. It means to lose strength. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotions. What I think, what I want, what I feel. You know what? When that gets weak... He says, when my soul, when my mind, my will, my emotions, when it got weak... When I, they lost strength within me, I remembered the Lord. As long as I'm strong, then I rely on me. I have to be weak. I have to realize how weak I am. When I, me, and myself are strong, 
then I don't pray to God. I'm self-sufficient. I got this. Or other people will say, you got this. That's worldly talk. God has this. And God has to help me if I'm going to have it. That's why Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong. God's not looking for strong people. God's looking for weak people. Because we'll rely then on His strength. Then we'll remember the Lord. You don't forget the Lord in weakness. You forget the Lord in strength. When you think you've got it all on your own and you're, you're, you're handling things by yourself. You're self-sufficient. When I get weakened and I lose strength, that's when I cry out to God. When I am weak, then am I strong. Number three. Number three. When we cry out to God, He is quick to hear us. This is a wonderful thing. Did you notice? He said, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. Verse 2. And He heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Isn't it great that God's listening? Isn't it great that when we come to the end of ourselves and we've come to the end of us and we cry out to God, God says, I'm listening. I'm waiting for you. You see, God isn't so much paying Jonah back as He's bringing Jonah back. He's bringing him back to usefulness for him. The afflictions, the pain, the grief, the suffering, the distress, that's not God's punishment. That's God loving him. So he'll come back to him. We all tend to magnify our problems. Now when you magnify something, what do you do? Yeah, Somebody says you make it bigger. You don't. You make it look bigger. You put a magnifying glass in your words of your Bible, it didn't make the words bigger. It made them look bigger. Someone else looks at those same words, they say, no, same size they always were. But when you look through that glass, it makes them look bigger. You know what we do? Most of us look at our troubles through that magnifying glass and they look bigger than they really are. We magnify our problems. We magnify our troubles. And so we make our problems look bigger. And as Jonah saw the journey, and he saw Nineveh, and he saw the wicked people of Nineveh, he called, that's all he could see. That's how big everything was. And what he needed to see was God. That God's in control. That God is sovereign. That God has a plan. That's why he ends up by saying in verse 9, Hey, I'll sacrifice un unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. It's up to God if He wants to save people. It's not up to me. What he needed to see was God. He was focusing so much on the problem of Nineveh, he couldn't see the solution, and that's God. That's why at RU, we, we stress the fact, and they stress the fact, you don't come together to focus on the problems. We don't sit around in the challenge groups and everybody talks about their, their difficulties and their struggles and what I'm dealing with. You're, you're not focusing on the problem. You're focusing on the solution. And the solution is Jesus Christ. If you, we talked about this before, whatever you're focusing on, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're talking about, that's what you're going to do. Well then, let's not focus on what, I'm, what I don't want to do. Let's focus on who I should be focused on. That's Jesus Christ. God knew what it, take, what it would take to get Jonah to stop running and stop rejecting his rule and reign in his life. So God allows and even ordained Jonah's suffering in order to show Jonah how inept he is, in order to show Jonah how much he really does need God. Jesus said, without me ye can do nothing. 
But we usually don't see that when we're right in the middle of being on our own. It's in hindsight that we look back and we see, wow, I see now God was trying to teach me something. God was really trying to get a hold of me through that. And God loves you enough, and God loves me enough, He'll do whatever it takes to bring us back to Him. So Jonah prays. And when he said, I'll pay my vows, salvation of the Lord, verse 10 says, the Lord spake unto fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry ground. So finally we get a praying prophet, and once we get a praying prophet, we get a puking fish. Okay, how's that? So he spits Jonah out on, on dry ground. And the great thing is, chapter 3 starts out, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. By the way, same thing he said the first time. But now Jonah is ready to hear it. Now Jonah is ready to obey it. But now, before we close, I just want to share one other thing with you, a little deeper truth here from Jonah. Maybe not, not so much deeper, just a, a bigger perspective of this story of Jonah. There's a, a wider context of, of that of the whole Bible. The story of Jonah has some what, what, what we call sometimes typology. And I want you to see that before we end our lesson for this evening, and then we'll head into chapter 3 next week. The Bible is 66 different books, but it's one book. Do you understand? There's a theme all the way through the Bible. There's, there's a single purpose and a divine mind behind it. I know 40 different human authors, but there's really only one author, and that was God. That's why you can't find a contradiction in it. You can't find 40 other guys to write 40 books and nobody contradicts somebody else. It's impossible. But God wrote a book. And so it needs to be understood as one book and one author. The Old Testament gives us some indications about how God's salvation works. We had the Passover lamb in Exodus. The blood being applied to the doorpost. So when the death angel came, he'd see the blood and pass over and not be under God's judgment. The entering into the promised land is not, not, a, not a picture of heaven, but a picture of victorious Christian living. When you got into the promised land, it's not heaven because the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hivi, all, the Hivi, all the ites were there. You don't have enemies. You don't have battles to fight when you get to heaven. Then the battles are over. But it is victory in Jesus. And by the way, it wasn't Moses, the law, that leads you to victory. It's Joshua, which is Jesus, that leads us to victory. On and on, Noah and the flood shows us God's judgment and how believers are safe from that judgment. When those things happen, we say it's a type. It's a type or a picture. It's a prototype. And when we look at Jonah, Jonah is viewed as a type of Jesus Christ. Now, let me, let me show you the similarities. Jonah was a prophet of God. So was Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was more than a prophet. He was a son. He was a son of God. Jonah gave himself up to save others. He said, throw me overboard. That's the only way you're going to get any calm. Thinking that he would die. Jesus, of course, we know, gave his life to save others. God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. Jonah went down to a metaphorical grave. He spent three days in the belly of that fish. He said, out of the belly of hell, cried I, in verse 2. Jesus went to a literal grave and He spent three days and three nights in a real tomb and suffering hell for you and me. Literally. Now after three days, the fish restored Jonah to dry land, and after three days and three nights in the tomb, Jesus was restored to His place in God's kingdom. He was raised to new life. Now Jonah, I don't think, died in the belly of the whale, but he thought he did. Jesus didn't just think he died. Jesus died and was brought back to life by the Father. 
So you understand what happened to Jonah here, while we know it's his story, in the wider context of the Bible, it has a bigger meaning. A picture of salvation and ultimately a picture of Jesus Himself. And you think, man, are you stretching that, Pastor? Well, look at Matthew chapter 12, would you please? Go to Matthew chapter 12. What's interesting is we don't have to whether, know whether this is conjecture or not because Jesus spoke to this. Matthew chapter 12. Verse number 38. Where the Bible says, The certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered and said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. There's Jonah. Well, what's that sign? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, I'm, I'm not just saying Jonah pictured Jesus' time in the, in the grave. Jesus is saying that. That's your sign. That was your picture for you to believe, is what he told the scribes and the Pharisees. So Jesus was conscious he was following Jonah's footsteps. Now there are a couple differences, and you need to make sure you understand this. Jonah ended up in trouble because he rebelled against God. Jesus never rebelled against God. Jesus didn't go to the cross because of rebellion against God. In fact, it was obedience that took him there. Jesus never was confused about why he was here. He knew exactly why he was here and why he came. Jesus was the only person that ever lived in perfect harmony with God. Jesus said, I always do those things that please Him. He's the only one that can ever say that. I want to always do the things that please Him. But I don't always do that. But I want to. And that's where most of us would be. Secondly, and we, we mentioned this earlier, all the talk of Jonah's going down to the grave, he didn't really die, but Jesus really did die, and he really did rise from the dead. And while I'm here, I'll just put a parenthesis in here. It's interesting, three days and three nights. Jesus said, are there not twelve hours in a day? So we know that daytime was twelve hours. But we also know there were four watches of the night. The night watches were from 6 to 9 p.m., 9 to midnight, midnight to 3, and 3 to 6 a.m. So there must be 12 hours at night as well. So the daytime must be 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Jesus said, I'll be in the grave three days and three nights. And so you're not going to get three days, 12-hour periods, three nights, 12-hour periods, and Jesus die on Friday and get up Sunday morning. Okay? So... Uh, I, I had a Bible study I do occasionally, and maybe it's time to pull it out again. I, it's called the hoax of Good Friday. Uh, it's a real popular one, I can tell. But uh, we just succumb to whatever, the, frankly, we just succumb to whatever the Catholic Church says, and, and people just copy that. But, you know, the, the final authority isn't the church. The final authority isn't what we think. The final authority is what God's Word says. And so uh, the, the great thing is, and we'll pick it up here next time, verse, uh, chapter 3, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. God, aren't you glad God gives second chances? And, and maybe third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances too. But God's going to give another opportunity. And this time Jonah will go to Nineveh and preach what God says to preach. All right, let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening now. We thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Jonah and what we're learning from you putting his story in, in your book. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would help us to remember that you are sovereign, that you are the one who's in control of our life. Help us to understand that the things that happen to us, the things that have happened in anyone's life here, are things that you intended to use in our life to mold us, to shape us into the vessel you want us to be.
And I pray you'll help some folks here this evening that would be able to say, yes, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God worked it together for good. I pray, Lord, you'd remind us that when we get afflicted, we would not just ask you to get me out of this or get rid of the affliction. But, Lord, we would seek you. We would realize that when we get in distress and we get in pain and we get in agony, those are the times you want us to cry out to you. Then let us remember the Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for being a God who listens when we cry. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be praying people we would desire to be in contact with you at all times and be obedient to what you call us to do. We love you, Lord. Thank you for giving your Son to die in our place that we might have eternal life. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful that you go with us. May others see Christ in our life this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Let's sing that together for our dismissal song. In choir, you come right on up for your practice. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. God bless you. You're dismissed.